breathe. Let me say one thing about Jan. And it was turn it over to him. This is a man of contagious excitement and faith. He always has been. When I met Jim, I was like, I know that Moscow is where I need to be. And I really believed that, and he instilled it in me. <laughs> and then I met Pastor Dave. Now, I'm glad I met Jim first. And I actually probably met, I don't know who I met first, but, but Jim just, he gets the excitement in you. I know that when Tom met Jim years and years ago, was that in Costa Rica? Or, yeah. That it's just like there, there's something that goes out of gym and it makes a church want to be involved in missions. It makes a church want to fulfill the Great Commission. And you guys already know that about him. He's been here so many times. I'm just going to turn it over to my good friend, Jim Purr. Amen. I'll bl blame everything on me, right, Kevin? Amen. Well, I am thrilled to be here this morning. Um, uh, I've, um, many of you know me, and uh, how many of you know that... Um, I treat it, uh, um, how should I say this? I try to be transparent. How many of you know God wants transparent people? Amen. And uh, I believe I have a word for this body of believers this morning. I got into the United States on Friday. My luggage got here yesterday. Everybody say praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm wearing clean clothes. Everybody say praise the Lord again. <laughs> And if anybody is missing their luggage or traveled, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but um, uh, my wife and our, one of our daughters is still in Budapest. I'm just going to be here in the United States a week. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to go see Dave and uh, maybe uh, Dave uh, and then probably Tom tomorrow and uh, get to see all my old friends. But uh, uh, we pass out these cards. Um, we're in Budapest, Hungary. Um, because we pass out these cards because most people don't know where Hungary is. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And, you know, we've been living there for 21 years. My wife and I, we've been missionaries for 36 years. We've been married for 37 years. And we absolutely love doing what we're doing. We're not, um, somebody told me uh, 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 this past summer, uh, when we were in the United States for a brief period of time, they go, how much longer do you have to be over there? Like we're paying a price in prison. How many of you know? And how many of you know you get to serve the Lord? Amen? And so we love doing what we're doing. Um, it's, it's, we're living our dream. Um, and we just, uh, we choose to love to do what we're doing. Amen? And, uh, but we uh, pass out these cards to show you where Hungary is and uh, where we're working in that part of the world. It's in Eastern Europe. And uh, 20 some years ago, that part of the world was all closed to the gospel. And it was under the, how many of you remember the Iron Curtain? Somebody behind the Iron Curtain where you had to smuggle Bibles into that part of the world. And you, pastors and Christians uh, were persecuted. And now there's probably more freedom in that part of the world to preach the gospel than, than there is in the United States. Where you could go into schools and they want you to teach the kids Christianity. Wanted, they want the kids, not necessarily because they want the gospel in there, but they want to give the kids morals. How many of you know we could use some morals? And so we go in there and we share John 3.16 and different things. And some kids come to Christ, but they all hear the gospel. And, uh, but, um, uh, we've, and we also pass out this card if you'll, everybody took it. And some of you got them last year. And it's got a magnet in there. You can put it on your refrigerator. How many of you know you aren't missionaries serving for 36 years and absolutely loving if people aren't praying for you? How many of you know there's a real enemy that doesn't want us in Budapest, Hungary? Just like there's a real enemy that doesn't want this church in Yerington, Nevada. Uh, you don't have to go 7,000 miles to fight battles. I think we all know that. But because we ask you to pray for us and put that on there, and I always say this, um, when we ask you to pray for us, we don't necessarily mean for 45 minutes every morning. We believe 45 seconds of prayer mixed with faith is powerful. Let me say that again. 45 seconds of prayer mixed with faith is powerful. Amen? And what you say, you know, I, I always give this example. You could be standing in the line, getting ready to check out at Walmart. <laughs> and our names come before you. Let me tell you, that's not the devil. <laughs> that's usually the Holy Spirit or Pastor Kevin's names come before you. And somebody said, well, how do you pray standing in line at Walmart? Well, you, you step out of line. How many of you know that's a step of faith? <laughs> 
and, uh, and you go to some place in the store and you say, God bless Jim and Brenda, they're in Budapest, and uh, anoint them, protect them, give them wisdom, and I believe that's powerful, amen? And a lot of times we, I used to think, man, wait till I get through the line, and then I'll pray. By that time, you forgot about it. Amen? And so you go that, and I believe that's powerful. And I find when I listen to those small things, God begins to show me greater things. Amen? How many of us want to hear greater things? And so um, we also pass out the thing. Many of the, uh, uh, the, this church has supported us every month. Since 1985. That's a long time, amen? And many of the people in the church support us, and we just really appreciate it. And uh, we just pray. How many of you know everybody's needs will be met if everybody's being led by the Holy Spirit, amen? And just be led by the Holy Spirit. If you want to be a greater part of our ministry, go ahead and fill that out. And uh, But um, I just want to share a little bit. I'm going to show you a video right now. Uh, about what we do in Eastern Europe because a lot of times people think uh, they can't relate because it's a different country and different people. And this will show you a little bit about what we're doing in Eastern Europe. Then I'm going to share a little bit of a word. Amen? So you can go ahead and start it. Here we are, Here we are in Serbia today, Romania. We are thrilled to be able to help start new churches in both areas. We minister in Macedonia, a nation of 3.9 million people. We are privileged to be helping national pastors in Albania. We're here in the central market in Budapest today. We are honored we have been able to help start four new churches in the nation of Czech, a nation of 10.5 million people where less than 2.9 percent of the people are born again. My name is Jim Furr. My wife Brenda and I live here in Budapest, Hungary, and we've based out of Budapest since 1997. We work in the former communist countries of Eastern Europe. Previous to uh, 1990, all of the countries in Eastern Europe, from Poland to in the north, to Bulgaria in the south, and Albania in the south, were all under communism. It's very difficult to preach the gospel here. But since the fall of communism in 1990, there's almost complete freedom to preach the gospel in this part of the world. The focus of our ministry is help national leaders start churches in cities, towns, and villages that don't have any evangelical churches in them. And that could mean a town of 25,000 people with no church in it. It amazes us to be in a town of 25,000 or 50,000 people or 5,000 people where there's no Baptist, Assembly of God, no Methodist, no Charismatic, uh, any type of church. And we know that we don't have to pray about whether God wants churches in those towns. And so we work with national leaders in all the countries of Eastern Europe to help them start churches in those towns. And since the year 2000, we have seen over 200 new churches established in these towns, and they're reaching people for Christ. One of the things we do as a church is we look at the students' ministry, both the people like Jim and Brenda. Uh, God helped us to open the door and gave us amazing treasures and see amazing things happening in the, in, at the university campuses in Krakow, and we are very grateful for that. We are so grateful to Jim and Brenda for the ministry, for the heart. They come and help us to start the church because with people like them, we can do what God called us to do in the places like Krakow in Poland. So we are so grateful for the heart, for the passion, and for the love. Several churches, not only just starting in Plansky, but also up to today, that they are going on and they are still existing. We're pastoring a church here in Krakow. It's really called Church for the City of Krakow because we believe God has put us here to uh, serve the city. We're really privileged to, to have Jim and Brenda come alongside what we're doing and helping us, enabling us to, to minister in the city. We've been able to make an impact upon the nations of Eastern Europe, and we're so excited about what the future holds and how many more churches that we can start. Thank you for helping us do what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. How many of you want to come visit us? <laughs> few people. <laughs> okay, amen. Well, we love doing what we're doing. Let me just, uh, if you, you don't have to turn your Bibles, I'm going to turn to us, share a scripture up here that I'm just going to share some different stories and uh, some of the stories you have heard before, but I'm going to tell them again because I like them, amen? <laughs> I like to hear them myself, and I believe that uh, everything, but I want to share a scripture this morning in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and it's the story that uh, my favorite book in the whole Bible is the book of Acts. It's, uh, 
it's an action book. I, I like action movies. It seems like everything is happening in chapter after chapter. I mean, I like the old Indiana Jones kind of movies, you know, where something just keeps you going all the way. And that's how I see the book of Acts. And uh, here in Acts chapter, this story takes place um, in Acts chapter th uh, 3 and 4 where pa Peter and John were going to the, the temple to pray and they saw um, a person on the side of the road there at the gate and, uh, you know, probably Jesus had walked by the same person. I don't know, but he'd been there forever. And, uh, and uh, Peter and John, they reached down there and they saw him get he told them they, the guy was begging, can I have some money? And they said, silver and gold have I none. We all know the story. Such as I have, I give to thee. And uh, he, they reached down and raise up and the guy started walking and it wasn't one of these little healing things where um, uh, he just started walking but this guy we would call it today he freaked out amen do you know what I'm talking about he's running around jumping and screaming how many of you want to see some stuff like that amen and it had just took somebody like that to reach down and um, and said such as I have I give to thee so this guy he gets all healed he's walking around everybody knows it causes a big stir how many of you know quite often when you see the hand of God moving religious people are going to get upset because you know they lose control how many of you know we need to lose control sometimes and uh, they took Peter and John before the, the, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, and they said, uh, they, said they, well, they should stop doing this and things like this. And then this scripture, I love this scripture. I was reading it a number of months, months ago, and it's talking about when the leaders of the Sanhedrin, uh, were, were, uh, when, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men. Everybody say ordinary men. I like that, that they're ordinary. Quite often we think everybody's got to be gifted and have all this special. All of us, in the eyes of men, we're ordinary, but God sees us different. Amen? And uh, they were unschooled and ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that they had they that these men had been with Jesus how many of you know when we're with Jesus something should transform in us I uh, sometimes uh, I was telling Pastor Kevin earlier that people sometimes want to introduce us when we speak at a church as Apostle Jim <laughs> And I don't like that because that just, uh, I feel like I'm very ordinary. I grew up ca uh, in the Catholic church. I, I, mean, I mean, I haven't gone to college. I never graduated from college or anything like that. But I believe that, and, um, but God saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. How many of you know God sees something in all of us more than we see ourselves? I remember the, uh, we lived... Uh, six years in Costa Rica. We lived three years, and our two boys, we have two of our boys that were born there. They got uh, Costa Rican passports and American passports. They're dual citizens. And then we lived three years in Moscow, and that's where we met Pastor Kevin. And uh, then we've lived, we're in our 21st year in Budapest, Hungary. But I remember, and that's how in the Costa Rica, this is how we connected with Yerington Vineyard Fellowship. We were there, uh, we moved there in 1982. In 1985, a group from Yerington Vineyard Fellowship came. We were living on the edge of the, the jungle in Costa Rica out in a small village called Parita. Everybody say Parita. <laughs> It's a little thing, and uh, no dirt road. I mean, all dirt roads, and it was very, very hot. In this group from Yarrington, we had a mutual friend, and you ca this a group came, and they spent ten days, and they built a church, or we built a church in ten days. We were working twelve hours days. You remember all those days, <laughs> Ralph and uh, Richard and the other people that were on those trips, and uh, and I remember. For the first two years that we had been in Costa Rica, and uh, we, were, we, we were so unqualified. In fact, we had ministers come visit us from the United States and tell us we had no business being missionaries. How many of you know that's encouraging? <laughs> How many, in the natural, they were probably right. But God doesn't see us in the natural. And I remember when Pastor Tom Chisholm came down with that group. Uh, we hosted them for that 10 days that they were there. And Yarrington Vineyard Church believed in us. 
they saw something in us and began supporting us. And I'm convinced we're here today because of Yerington Vineyard Fellowship. Because you believe. How many of you know it's good to believe in people? Even growing up as a, I, I didn't receive Christ till I was 17 years old. Uh, anybody would have asked me if I was a Christian, I would have said, of course I'm a Christian. And, you know, with that kind of thing. And, uh, but uh, I remember, um, you know, sometimes even those that are most close to us don't see the value in us. How many of you understand that? I remember when I was 17 years old, I was, uh, of course, not a Christian. And um, it was the uh, first time I got arrested. And uh, my father had to get me out of jail. We were uh, felony shoplifting, I had several thousand dollars worth of stuff and uh, drugs in the car. How many of you know I was scared? <laughs> and my father came and picked me up from the jail in Denver, Colorado. And my father tells me on the way home, and this is no indictment on my father, please understand that. Amen? Do you know what I mean? I, I never want to. My father tells me on the way home, Jimmy, I've raised eight kids, and you're the dumbest of all of them. <laughs> Nowadays, I'd have all kinds of issues. <laughs> Maybe I do. <laughs> but years later, of course, my father got saved. And years later, they, uh, we found out from my brothers and sisters, my father told all of us at one time that. They didn't have James Dobson to teach them how to raise kids. Do you remember that? And, uh, but, you know, all these things go against because, but God sees power in all of us, in ability in all of us. We lived six years in Costa Rica, and this church came down there twice. We built two churches. Those churches are still going on today, and see, people are still coming to Christ in those churches. And then we lived in Moscow for three years, and uh, my wife, who is from Florida, um, she grew up Baptist, Kevin, <laughs> like you did, and uh, she used to go to revivals at her Baptist church. And, uh, they, and she'd go forward as a little girl, and she'd tell the Lord, oh, Lord, I'll go anywhere in the world you want me to go. Anywhere, as long as it's warm. <laughs> How many of you know God loves those kind of prayers? <laughs> and I remember we moved to Moscow, and we were at Red Square there one time, and I saw on the digital thermometer, it said minus 33 degrees. And let me tell you, in Celsius or Fahrenheit, that's cold. <laughs> But we, we ended up living there for three years. Our kids loved it. And we made a choice. We're going to love it. We lived in an apartment complex. Pastor Kevin, he lived at the same place. And the same thing, there were 16,000 people in our apartment complex. We lived on the 22nd floor. Sometimes the elevator worked. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, we lived there, and uh, part of the time, and a uh, city of 11 million people, and we chose to love it, therefore our kids loved it. And we just absolutely, we made a decision. And then we had traveled all over that part of the world, and I was telling different stories to Kevin in the last couple of days, different adventures we've had with the, the police and just living in Russia and all that kind of thing. And uh, then in 1997, we moved to Budapest, Hungary. We thought we'd live there from one to three years. Now we're in our 21st year. And in Eastern Europe, we travel. We live in Budapest. It's a city of two and a half million. But we're able, it's within 250 miles to a nine different countries. How many of you know God puts you in strategic places? And uh, even Wednesday of this week, I was in Prague, Czech Republic. I left in the morning, came back, came back that afternoon. So I can drive to Serbia, I can drive to Prague, I can drive. And we work with national leaders, like we said in the video there, to help start churches in cities and towns and no churches, with no churches. And since 1999, we have seen 293 new churches started in Eastern Europe. This church, Yarrington Vineyard Fellowship, with either the church sponsoring or individual. See, we've seen 16 or 17 of the churches sponsored out of this church in Eastern Europe. We invest $4,000 in each one of those churches. And uh, we know that $4,000 doesn't make a church go. But it's the anointing and the vision of the pastor that makes it go. But at least they got one church in the town. And when you're the only church in town, you're not worried about the people down the street. Or another church, or another church. You're the only ones there. I wish I could tell you there's revival going on in Eastern Europe, 
but uh, there's not revival going on in Eastern Europe. You don't have towns of 50,000 people if there's revival. But we're preparing for revival. Amen? And somebody said, amen. <laughs> and uh, somebody said, well, Jim, what kind of churches are they? Charismatic? Are they faith church? They just call themselves Christian churches. And they just believe the Bible. Because most of them were atheists before. And they haven't been taught anything. And so they just believe, everybody believes in healing. And we don't tell them any different. <laughs> and so it's making an impact. I wish I could tell you, I mean, all these churches are doing great, but I could tell you, all of them have problems. <laughs> you know why? Because there's people in them. <laughs> and some of them are 25 people, some of them are 225 people, some of, but at least there's a church in it. And, uh, so, and everyone's got problems, and they, uh, the church has got problems, but they're making an impact. And this year... We're going to plan on starting another 12 churches in Eastern Europe. Pe Pastor Kevin, we've already got the finances for four of those churches. And they're starting. And uh, one of the neat things that we get to do is um, in Eastern Europe and all the different countries, there's six million gypsies in Eastern Europe. And they're in, all in Hungary and they're in Bulgaria, they're in Poland and they're in Macedonia, all the different countries there, and they have their own group, and nobody likes the gypsies because they're, you know, just different. They have their own language, their own thing, uh, their own culture. I don't know, Richard, I don't know if we went to a gypsy church when you were over there a few years ago, but they have their, and they have their own culture. A lot of them can't read, and uh, they got guys that are 39 years old getting married to 12-year-old girls, and it's just totally different. And nobody wants to mess with them. But how many of you know God wants to mess with them? And in the last uh, 12, 14 years, we've seen 25 gypsy churches started. And this year, we'll see a couple of more gypsy churches. And I shared this story uh, a number of, uh, the last time I was here and a few years ago, uh, we started in a, a church in the city of Skopje, Macedonia. Everybody say Macedonia. And it was a Macedonian church, and the guy's name was Sasha. And uh, we worked with him real good, and we started several churches there. But about four years ago, Sasha calls me up, and everybody, nobody here in the United States, I'm known as Jim, but everybody in Eastern Europe, Jim sounds very strange. It sounds Chinese, Jim, Jim, Jim. <laughs> and so everybody calls me James over there. And because they all know James because of James Bond. And uh, my wife says I'm like James Bond, but without the girls. <laughs> With just one girl. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sasha calls me up about four years ago from Macedonia and said, he tells me about his church and it's doing good. And he goes, James, we have a village outside of our city, Skopje, the capital of Macedonia. And there's a 7,000 people. And there's a, a group of gypsies there. And it's all gypsies. It's hardly any electricity, outdoor running water and local pumps and all that kind of thing. And we have a heart to start a church there because there's no church there. He goes, will you help us? How many of you know I didn't have to pray about it and so we a few months later we we I go down there we give the finance the four thousand dollars to help start the church and four thousand dollars usually lasts from one to two years to help get the church off the ground to rent a building that kind of kind of thing and and I remember there's no building in this gypsy village to hold a church because there's no kind of cultural hall or no kind of school or anything like that so the this Sacha him and his team from the Macedonian church go in there they get somebody's house and they put some benches in there and move all the furniture out and about 80 people are crowded in this little house you can picture it Kevin and they're looking in the windows and it's the summertime and uh, kids are smoking cigarettes in the back and other kids are sniffing glue in the back I love that kind of stuff amen because that's they don't know how to act in church because they've never been to church before. And, uh, and uh, we go in there and we uh, lead some songs in their gypsy language that some of the worship leaders knew and uh, some of them in the Macedonian language and the gypsies just love to sing and there's a dog on the floor in there and there's kids running around and it was just total chaos. And because kids are walking everywhere and people smoking cigarettes and all that kind of... And, uh, and in about 15 minutes... Dwayne, 
the presence of the Lord came in there. There was still chaos. But I'd rather have the presence of the Lord and chaos than everything decently in order and no presence of the Lord. And because the presence of the Lord came in, there was still all these people walking around, but they could sense something. And their attention span is so small and so short. And so we just do short messages. And they've never heard about the Bible. They've never heard about Jesus. They never heard about any of this kind of stuff. And But the presence of the Lord was there. And they didn't know the words getting saved or getting born again. You know, people that have never been to church, they don't understand that. But we talk to them and just share them a little bit. Come forward if you want Jesus. There's Jesus that we're talking about and coming around. This kid, every, half the church comes forward in this gypsy church and they're just walking forward. Nobody's closing their eyes. They're walking down the aisle smoking cigarettes coming forward. And I remember we lead the prayer. We ask them to repeat this prayer. And, you know, they don't know to close their eyes. <laughs> So they're just looking at it, and this kid is smoking a cigarette, Pastor Kevin, as he's repeating the prayer. I love it, and God loves that. Somebody said, well, Jim, they need to be more holy. Whatever happened to come as you are? Whatever happened to come as you are? And, you know, when I gave my life to the Lord, when I was 18 years old, somebody invited me to a church like this. I grew up, and I never went to an evangelical church. I didn't understand what they were saying. I didn't, I wanted to, you know, go like, because that's the kind of church I grew up in, you know. And, you know, you, you know all that kind of thing. And, uh, and, um, and I came forward, and I didn't understand the words born again. I came forward and pre repeated the prayer. I didn't understand anything I was saying, Tanya. But God came in my heart. Because God wants us more than we want him. Do you guys understand that? Six months later, I go back to that gypsy church in Macedonia. It's been going for six months. There's still chaos. <laughs> but maybe a little bit less. And the kids are still smoking and it's all that. But they're in the word of God. I've been saved for 40 years. There's still issues that God's working on me. So I just love that. And maybe that kid smoking a cigarette is going to be the pastor of that church because they look like ordinary men, unschooled. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? This is exciting. I love, we take chances on people. Most of the pastors of these new churches in Poland and Bulgaria and Hungary they haven't been to Bible schools because there aren't Bible schools over there. They just grow up in a church like this. I remember one time, and I don't pick the pastors because I speak fluent Spanish, pretty good Russian, uh, bad Hungarian. Somebody said, well, you've been living there 20 years. Why don't you speak good Hungarian? I go, when you're on your fourth language, you can criticize me. Amen? <laughs> My Hungarian is we go to store bread by. <laughs> And they go, oh, you speak good Hungarian. <laughs> and they say, how long have you been here? And I said, oh, it's been over a year. <laughs> and they, amen, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just lazy. My wife and our kids speak good Hungarian, but I'm just lazy. But we work with 13 different languages. And nobody knows each other's languages. And so we work with these key pastors in Poland and in Slovakia and Bulgaria. And, and uh, somebody said, well, Jim, you know which one of these churches are going to make it. You know, because I don't pick the pastors. They come out of the local church. I don't oversee them. Local churches in Slovakia and Hungary, they oversee these new churches because I don't get into their doctrine or their issues, and I can't talk their language. But God wants a church in those towns. And so we work with key leaders in these countries. And uh, I remember somebody said, you can tell which church is going to make it and which one's not when you're there. I go, I ain't got a clue. I think a lot of those guys that Jesus chose we would have thought they ain't going to make it because they were just like us. <laughs> Had issues after they got filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to a, a church in Slovakia. I was there for the first service and uh, meeting with this key leader and meeting with the new pastor of this church in Liptovsky Radok, Slovakia. 
And uh, I, I think somebody in this church sponsored that church. And uh, I get introduced to the new uh, pastor, and his name is Arkady or something like that. And uh, he's going to share a little bit for the first time in the new church that he's going. And he's looking in the book of table of contents for the book of Timothy. <laughs> And he's going to pastor the church. Year and a half, half later, he's got 125 people because he loved the people and he cared about them. Another church, I was in Bulgaria. A number of years later, this, past, this new pastor had graduated from Bible school. <laughs> And I meet him, and he said, we're going to tear down the devils in this city, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Three months later, he quits. <laughs> so you don't know who's going to make it. and who's gonna, But we just trust people and trust God that they're going to make an impact. And people in Eastern Europe, they love the United States. Everywhere we go, we get favored treatment. Because they see the fall of the Soviet Union was because of the United States. As soon as they, people find out we're Americans, we get favored treatment. I remember one time we were in Poland starting a, a church in Zlatoria. Everybody say Zlatoria. 37,000 people. We go to meet the mayor there. Because we're going to be there for a week, a group of Americans. He don't even know why we're there, but there's a group from America coming to their city. And they're just so happy. And he, they all got relatives here in the United States. And so they're, we're there and we go into the mayor's office and he's not smiling because you know how those pictures are, some of those people in, in the government things. And they're all serious. And he goes, we, in all in Polish, through in translator, you are, we're glad you're here in, your, in our city. And, uh, and, um, and uh, you know, we're glad you're here in he, we, we could, anything we can do for you this week, we were uh, going to paint the special needs kids' uh, house, I mean, uh, home, and go to some of the schools. He opened up all the schools for us. The whole week we were there, he took down the Polish flag over City Hall and put up the American flag. And we told him we were there to share the gospel and uh, go into all the schools. They opened up all the schools, and he became our friend. We prayed with him. He didn't close his eyes. He just kind of looked. But how many of you know God can use people that are not, aren't saved? Sometimes he can use people that aren't saved easier than people that are saved. <laughs> are you guys with me? <laughs> because we make everything so spiritual. This year, we're going to believe God another 12 churches. And next year, and uh, we're going to believe for another 10 to 15 churches. And after that, and somebody said, well, Jim, why don't you believe God for 30 churches? That's not what God has told us to do. Of those 293 churches, probably about 270 some of them are still going on. Have we failed because some closed? The only time we fail is when we're not obedient to the Lord. It's because a lot of times what looks like failure to us is not failure to God. When Jesus died on the cross, it looked like failure. But it wasn't failure to God. Impacting the nations. I know what it is to be ordinary. I mean, my wife, she could tell you how ordinary I is. My wife is very, very, she's the one that gets up and prays and does her devotions. I want to sleep. I go, Brenda, be quiet. <laughs> I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> how many of you know that's not so spiritual? <laughs> but God uses ordinary people. Ordinary people. So much potential. Our kids have grown up all over the world. Our oldest son, Nathan, I talk about him a lot. He's 33 now. Him and Stephen, they know each other from way back. And Ryan, they lived in uh, friends in Moscow. And, uh, and, uh, but our son, our boys grew up on the mission field. And I remember when we were living in Costa Rica and our son was 15 years old. And uh, he was part of the worship team and everything like that at the church. And we're living in Budapest. And one day, Pastor Kevin, he comes home from the mall there in Budapest, and his hair is the same color as my shirt. Let me tell you, I'm not a blue hair kind of dad. <laughs> and people say, well, that ain't no big deal, but it's my son. <laughs> and he comes in and he goes, Dad, what do you think? I was furious, man of faith and power that I am. <laughs> 
Brenda comes in. She likes it. <laughs> I'm mad at her and my son. <laughs> Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? And I'm not trying to be like, I try so hard not to be like my dad. Because my dad wanted to, it, it wouldn't talk to us because we had long hair. But it's sometimes hard. <laughs> and uh, Brenda takes me to the other room before I could say something. Everybody say, before I could say something. <laughs> Because sometimes the words that come out of our mouth in the midst of a crisis or a challenge can determine whether we'll receive victory or failure. But that's hard. It's easy to preach on Sunday morning. When your son comes in there and my blood's boiling and I paid for that. <laughs> Brenda takes me in the other room and goes, Jim, it'll be all right. It's a good kid. He's a good kid. Nathan's a good kid. I go, but he's my son. <laughs> A few weeks later, it went back to normal. How many of you ever know I said praise the Lord? <laughs> and you know this story. He goes off to college, Christian college in, in Florida. And we're, our first son, he goes off to fly, and he's coming back for, to, for Christmas at, at Budapest. And all of our, our, our other three kids, and we meet him at the airport, and we're so excited. And, uh, and he was all excited to come back. And we're there at Immigration and Customs. And, Kevin, you know what it's like. You're waiting for somebody. And we're all excited. He comes, and he's coming through there. We're all hugging. All I could see is earrings. I struggled through that Christmas. <laughs> Didn't sleep much. I probably paid for them too. But I know the word works. So I write it in my Bible. This is what I'm believing for. Deliverance. <laughs> Those earrings. Whole year goes by. He comes back next Christmas. We're all excited. I know our faith works. He comes out of there, and he's got gauges. I could 15 feet. I could see through his ears. I didn't sleep good that Christmas. My wife could care less. Everybody said, that's not a big, but this is my son. But I know faith works, right, Pastor Kevin? The following year, a whole year goes by, he comes back for Christmas. I know they're going to be gone because I've spoken it. I've believed it. It's written in my Bible. <laughs> the gauges are there. And he's got a lip ring. <laughs> Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> but he was a good kid. He's on staff at a big church there and in Florida. Well, he's going to things. And uh, Brenda said he's got good kid. I go, what kind of church would have him on staff? <laughs> and Brenda says, well, he does a Bible school study at the high school at 6 o'clock in the morning. I mean, he's, what, 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 you know, yeah, hey, do you understand what I'm talking about? The following year, he's a senior. He comes back. He gets a job. Well, he's there at some kind of courthouse and all that stuff is gone in West Palm Beach and uh, you know they, they got to cover up all the tattoos and everything which I also paid for <laughs> and he comes through the at Christmas there all the metal was gone the lip ring how many of you know I had a good Christmas that year <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that it's all about me do you understand because I thought what are my friends gonna say and my kids are all serving the Lord to this day. And so, but I know what it is. To, I mean, everything is not so, you know, just not all battles are won in a day. And if my son still had that lip ring, I would love him. Amen. <laughs> and I probably would enjoy Christmas, but probably. <laughs> but um, so that's nothing to do with because God sees our heart. We see the outside. But all of our kids are serving the Lord. And um, somebody said, I, how much longer are you to be there? We take it one year at a time. My wife wants to live there the rest of our lives. But we got a couple of grandbabies in America. <laughs> so sometime we might be coming back or she might be make, taking more trips back. And, uh, but we are so excited about what God is doing in the world. We do not judge what God is doing in the world by what the news says. I don't watch the news. Years ago, it was stealing my joy. If something steals your joy, 
You need to take it out of your life. Because God is doing things in this world. And we get to be a part of it. All of us are ordinary people. Whether you're young, not so young, <laughs> in between, all of us. Whether you're a teacher, you work at Walmart, Target, Dillard's, wherever you work, or you're retired, all of us are ordinary people in man's eyes, but extraordinary people in God's eyes. Let's stand. Everybody say, I'm extraordinary. I can do extraordinary things with the power of God.